I wasn't sure if that was an ending, but it was beautiful. Good morning to you all. It's great to see you in the house of the Lord. Um, I have a, a word for you. It's called a call to worship that I've been trying to incorporate uh, in our worship every week to just remind us why we're here. And so receive these words. God watched over us as we slept last night. God was there when we awakened this morning. God is in this place among us now. God is in the singing, in the silence, in the sermon, in the prayers, and in you and me, God's people. Let's praise him and let's worship him with all that we have and all that we are. Amen? Amen. So again, it's good. I welcome you uh, into this place of worship and this time of worship. Uh, my name is Patty Hewitt. I'm one of the pastors here at Blackwater, and along with Reverend Angie Robertson, we do just greet you in the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. And we are glad that you are with us. If you are watching on Facebook this morning, uh, just give us some comments there in the thread. Let us know that you're here. Let us know if we can uh, pray for you, uh, anything at all. Uh, we are just so glad that you are tuning in and that you are joining us in this place. So let's bow for our opening word of prayer. Lord Jesus, on this second Sunday of Easter, the light of your love shines on. Your light has come into the world, and neither darkness nor evil nor even death itself could overcome it. And we who have been here with you through Holy Week and the first Easter morning have been made witnesses to the resurrection story, wandering and bewildered, hoping and singing, rejoicing and sometimes doubting. It is not always easy to believe with our minds and trust you with our hearts. So Lord, as our time here unfolds, we ask that you would build that faith in us wherever we are on our journey with you. And we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So I hope you picked up one of those white bags uh, that have a card in there for you to give us your name at least. Let us know that you were here. And then if we don't have an email or don't have a phone number or need a new address or whatever that is, please place that on that card. And then on the reverse side, uh, you're welcome to share, and really I want to say encourage to share any prayer requests that you might have that we can lift up and, and hold those with you, whether those are prayers of celebration or prayers uh, of mourning and prayers of sorrow, prayers of questioning. Uh, whatever that is, we want to partner with you, and we will do that. So uh, put those prayer requests on there, and then you can return those to the baskets. Uh, there's one here right here to my left and two in the back, along with any offering that you uh, might, might feel prompted to give this morning for the work of what we're doing here in this place. So please do that. Um, we keep telling and reminding people you're welcome to remove your mask once you're seated, but once you get up and start moving around, we just ask that you put them back on. We're, we're almost there, y'all. I can feel it. We're, we're almost there. So if you'll do that, we would appreciate that. And just a couple of reminders, I'm going to be starting a small group tomorrow evening. It's a seven-week 
uh, book and Bible study on eternity, and I'm so excited to dive into this. Um, there's still plenty of room for whoever wants to attend. Uh, it's going to be from 6 to 7.30 every Monday evening, again for seven weeks. Uh, so if that's something that you are interested in or you want to take part in, please just call tomorrow the church office or email uh, Melindy West, our administrative uh, assistant. Let her know that you're going to come, and we will have what you need tomorrow night. So uh, don't feel like I can't come because I'm not prepared. We want you to take this journey with us. Uh, so just let us know if you want to be a part of that. Um, I was just alerted to how beautiful our prayer garden looks today. And so I peeked out there. It is gorgeous. So if you have not walked through that prayer garden, please do that and see all the beautiful flowers that are blooming and just give God thanks for his creation. It truly is miraculous out there. And then finally, you'll notice that we have uh, flowers on our altar this morning. And these are given um, in honor of Dodie Denham in celebration of her birthday and her wedding anniversary. And they're given by Dwayne. So happy birthday and happy anniversary to you. <laughs> She's like this. But we celebrate, right? Community celebrates one another, and so we celebrate uh, those milestones with you. And so now I'm going to ask that you stand, uh, wave to each other, show each other the signs of peace, however you can do that without touching, and make sure you tell our audience on Facebook good morning as well. And now let us remain standing as we say together what we believe through the Apostles' Creed. Maybe. <laughs> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. God, you call us to be people of faith, yet we are often people with doubts. We doubt that love can grow again in relationships where anger and bitterness reign supreme. You know the strength of love and the power of prayer. Help us to be faithful people who love well. We doubt that peace can come in the Middle East, in Syria, in Palestine, where hatred and racism reign supreme, you know that peace is growing there. Help us to be faithful peacemakers. Yes. We doubt that in the world there is hungry, hunger and that there is despair and hopelessness and it seems like those reign supreme. But you know that there is enough food in the world. Help us to be generous and faithful you specialize in impossibilities, God. 
You walked on water, water, you heal the nations, you forgive sins, you set the captive free, you set us free from our captivities. This morning, God, we pray for people here who are filled with doubt, who wonder whether you exist and whether you are listening to our prayers, who wonder what this whole community thing is all about. We pray for people who doubt the purpose of life, who wonder whether to end it all, who face feelings of meaningless and despair. Even when we have that sinking feeling, God, give us the wisdom to turn to you. Lord, we want to believe. Help us in our unbelief and our doubts. Give us faith, small as a mustard seed, so that we can be your faithful people, believing in your power to save, believing in your power to reign supreme, believing that we can share this good news with everyone we meet. And so, God, this morning as we go into the, son that your, your, the prayer that your son prayed, let us unite our voices and remind each other of that unity that you call us into as we say the Lord's Prayer together this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
just showing off now. <sighs> Thank you, Justin. Ugh. I have to tell you now. I have to now. I have to confess, Justin. I turned to Angie and I said, "He's just showing off now." <laughs> God is showing off through you. I love that. I love that. So before we start into the message this morning, um, some of you may know this or some of you may not, but for the next several weeks, we will be in the season called Easter Tide. Um, Easter Tide. And so the Easter season doesn't stop with just last Sunday on Easter morning, Easter day, but it goes all the way through Pentecost, which means 50. So for 50 days, we continue to be in this Easter tide, which is one reason that we're uh, going to be listening to and um, just receiving what God wants us to know with these post-resurrection stories of Jesus and the things that happened um, pretty soon after he was resurrected from the grave. Um, so, uh, so today, it, again, it is still like this Easter season, and so we continue to rejoice, and we are glad about that. So the story that we're going to look at today comes from the Gospel of John. And so uh, before we launch in, let me just say this about this story. Um, this person, one of the people that, that's in this account in the Gospel of John, uh, we don't describe him as the twin, which many Bible uh, versions use that word for this person, uh, the twin. We don't, we don't describe him that way. We don't call him Didymus, as the New International Version calls him in the Scriptures, Didymus. We don't really know him much by that name. And sometimes we don't remember that he was the one that said to his fellow brothers, his, the disciples of Jesus, as they entered into Jerusalem for the very last time, we forget that he said this. He said, let us also go that we may die with him, with our Lord Jesus. I mean, on fire disciple, you know, we forget about those words um, that he spoke. Um, rather, I think unfortunately, down through the ages, we know this man as a doubter. Do you know who I'm talking about? Thomas. We, that's how he's labeled. That, that is the word that describes him, that, that we even tell other people when they're doubting something that we're telling them, we call them a doubting Thomas, right? And I think that is unfortunate. I mean, who would want to be sacked with that descriptor, right? And I don't think, um, there's a big part of me that thinks it's unfair that we see him as that. Even though he did doubt, certainly, certainly God used him in, in major ways and, and did so as he followed the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to hopefully put aside those preconceptions that we might have about Thomas and just you know, thinking about him as being a doubter, and instead maybe seeing him in a new light and seeing this whole story uh, that we find in John's gospel in a new light. I don't want to label him as doubter today because I think this is a man, I believe that this is a man full of faith. So the poet Chris Jamie once said this. She said, doubt is a question mark. Faith is an exclamation point. And the most compelling, believable, realistic stories have included them both. And we are going to see that in a big way as we uh, come to our text. So um, to set this up, this is uh, still on Easter evening. The beginning part of the text is like, think last Sunday in the evening, the first part of what we will read, and then it will go to a week later, which lands us here today. So think about it. Last week it starts on Easter, and then it moves us into uh, the week after Easter, which would have been today. So again, John 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, Easter day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for the fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace 
be with you. As the Father has sent me, I so send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive any sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands... And put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So the disciples, can you imagine missing out on that, on that evening of Easter, being the one that like ran to the grocery store and missed out? On Jesus, right? But that happened. Why? The reason we don't know why Thomas wasn't there, but Thomas wasn't there. But when he gets back, his brothers tell him, "The Lord has risen. Like we have seen him with our own eyes. The Lord has risen. Would you believe it?" And Thomas, in other words, in my words, said, "Until I see it, I don't believe it." He just could not believe such a miracle would have taken place. He had to see this with his own eyes. And so down through the ages, we have known or believed uh, that Thomas was accused as being the only one who doubted on that first Easter evening, right? But here's the thing. All the disciples struggled with this. Every one of them struggled with this. When Mary came back from the tomb saying, The Lord has risen, those disciples didn't believe her. And even when they went back to the tomb, when they believed, they, they believed that the tomb was empty. And I do believe that John believed that Jesus was alive, but where did they go? They went back to that room and locked themselves in. There was a part of them that struggled with believing that Jesus was alive. And when you go back to some of the first words of this scripture that I just read, um, you'll remember this. After Jesus had said this, he showed his hands and his side to the disciples. And when the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. It wasn't until their eyes also laid upon the risen Jesus before they were filled with joy. Up until that time, they were also struggling with, could this be true? So when, you, when we look at this passage, I always think Thomas really didn't ask for anything that the disciples also didn't yearn for because they too needed to see before they could truly believe that this was real. So sometimes people have said, well, that reaction of Thomas, like I'm just not going to believe, it makes me squirm. It, I don't feel good to even read that. And, and, and I think part of that is because many of us have had times or right now have times of doubt or asking questions or being skeptical, right, of some things, whether it's the resurrection or something else. So we feel uncomfortable, especially with one of the disciples who doubted. And we chalk that up all too often, and I believe the church helps to do this, which is unfortunate, that if you have questions 
And if you doubt anything, then you are immature or you're not a believer at all. But what I see in this passage is something completely different. This man is asking um, in a way that, that God meet him, that Jesus meet him so that he can step forward with more and more faith. This is not someone who wants to turn and run from, from what he thought was the Son of God. This is somebody that really wants to believe into his bones, to the depths of who he is. Some of you might have been brought up in a tradition that says, if I doubt anything, if I ask anything, if I wonder about anything, if anybody finds out that I have these feelings, then that must mean I am not a follower of Jesus. It must mean that I am not a child of God. It must mean that I'm too immature to do this thing called the community of faith. And I want to tell you that that is not the truth. That is not truth. That is not good news. So let me read you some words by renowned Christian author Philip Yancey. And many of you would, will, have, will be familiar with this name. Written countless Bible studies, um, theological perspectives that are so deep. I mean, he is a true theologian. And these are his words when somebody asked him about this. He said, as a child, I attended a church that had little room for inquisitiveness. If you doubted or questioned, you sinned. So I learned to conform and never to raise my questions and doubts. And then he goes on to say, inquisitiveness and questioning are inevitable parts of the life of faith. It doesn't help simply to deny doubts or to feel guilty about them. Many people have been down that path before and have emerged with an even stronger faith. And I can't agree enough what Philip Yancey has to say. How many questions I have had in my 30 years of being a Christian, and I still have questions. And dare I say, there are some things I look at and go, oh, God, me and you got to have a little bit of a talk because I just can't go there. And, I, and originally I thought, that is horrible. I cannot let anybody know that. Like, I'm a bad person. And I've come to see that the more I, I give myself over to that, to lift those up to God, he helps we, me with more and more faith to go down that road with him and to believe with him and for him. You know, the deeper in, in a life of faith, in a life of God that we have, the more questions you're going to have. And you should have. The more you delve into the scriptures, the more you're going to be like, I just, what is this? And you're going you're gonna to sometimes struggle, sometimes celebrate. There are people that, that, you know, oftentimes will say, I can't even go there, right? I can't even wrap my mind around that. All of those are, are okay places to be. For it is in the seeking, right? It, it's when we come to God and we are seeking with the fullness of our heart and our mind that God welcomes our questions. And we can see that in this text, that Jesus welcomes Thomas's disbelief. And so we could continue analyzing Thomas and kind of pointing our fingers at him, doubting Thomas, doubting Thomas, right? And we could go, but we're not going to go down that road. Because, again, I don't want to label him. I want to call him Honest Thomas. And what I've come to see, really, for me, I really see that, you know what, yes, this story is about Thomas and the doubts that he has, but really, that's not the central message of this story. I see that the central truth of this story is in Jesus. It is what he does it is what he says. It is his actions toward Thomas and all of those disciples that we see um, just that manifestation of God's grace that Jesus is pouring out from the heart of God to these people who just can't believe it all right now. Just can't do it. So Jesus offers himself to Thomas, right? He says, put your hands in these marks which tell us that even it, when Jesus is resurrected, he still visibly has the marks that he had when he was crucified. So he tells Thomas, go ahead, touch. Like, here you go. I can see him stepping toward Thomas. Here, go at it. And look, 
lifting up his robe. Go ahead. That Yes, from the sword that, was, that pierced his side, right, on Good Friday. Go ahead. Put your hand in that space. And Jesus does this because he wants Thomas to have everything he needs to believe. He's, given, he's giving Thomas exactly what he's yearning for, what he's asked for, and what he has been honest about. And Jesus meets him in that place. Don't you think that's incredible? Jesus doesn't stand there with a waving finger. Jesus doesn't chastise him. He does say, blessed are those who's going to come after you who didn't see me like you're seeing me. Um, but that's a, that's, a, that's a promise. That's a declaration. That's not a ridicule. It's not to make Thomas feel smaller. But it is a statement of saying just how blessed will people be when they didn't have what you had, but yet they trust me and they believe in me. So Jesus refused to let bolts on a door get in the way of what these disciples need to go out in the world and share the good news. He's not going to let a closed door um, stop him from coming through it. Remember, the scriptures don't say he walked kind of through the door, but he appeared. So there was some kind of mystical, like he just appeared on the scene. He was not going to allow fear of those disciples um, that they had for the Jews. He was not going to allow uh, locked and closed doors. He was going to get in there, and he was going to meet those disciples exactly where they were. It is a beautiful story of how much God treasures each one of us. Each one of uh, his people that yearn to know him more, to love him more, to serve him more. This story helps us to know of a God who says, I want you to know what it means um, that I want you to walk humbly, right? And I want you to walk in a way that, that produces justice in the world. I want you to walk in a way in which um, you can proclaim my goodness, that you know what my wrath is all about. I want you to know that. And I feel like God in Jesus is saying, ask me anything. Come on, because I'm, I'm here for you. I am here, and I will deposit into you what you need. Just be honest with me. And I hear that as the call this morning. So when I have uh, come to experiences with my own struggles, what just keeps being reminded to my thoughts and to my hearts is there is no murkiness, no murky questions that I can uh, bring to, to God, to the foot of the cross, that God's going to reprimand me for that. There is no question of doubting wherever that doubting is that God is going to turn away and say, okay, you've asked way too much, you're seeking too much, I'm out of here. You know, that's not our God. God has met me in every single place. And yes, I still have questions. And I think I will always have questions because when we're students of the Scriptures, and when we are walking with Jesus, it's like a child. For those of you who have had children or nieces and nephews, do you remember the questions? Why is the sky blue? Why are there white things in the sky? Why do dogs bark? Why is the grass green? Why, 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 why? Doubting you at every kind of place as a good parent, as an aunt, as an uncle, as a grandparent, do you like spank those children for asking those questions or do you meet them where they are? I see that in this story, this is exactly where Jesus is. Now, let me say, I don't want you to leave here thinking, well, goodness, I really right now don't have doubts. I, I don't have a lot of questions right now. There must be something wrong with me. I'm not saying you have to have those to have faith. I don't want anybody here leaving thinking or hearing that I said that because that's not what I'm saying. But when you do... And I believe most of us do. Either you have or you do now or you will. I hope that you will trust God enough with that. That he's welcoming those questions. That he's welcoming those doubts. That he's welcoming you because you're seeking life with him. And that you will trust that he will fill you when the time is right for what you're, you need to continue to grow in your faith. To deepen and widen your faith and your life with him. 
So four things, and we're drawn to the end. So what do we do when these doubts, when these questions, when our one wondering creeps in? What are real hard, you know, things that we can actually do to help us through those times? Because again, if you've never been, if you're a studier of scripture or a follower of Jesus, you will. I've just labeled four that I hope will be helpful to you. Recognize them for what they are. Recognize them. Own them. Name your doubts. Trying uh, to ignore them, um, thinking that that's going to make them go away, it's not going to make them go away. And you know what? God knows what's in your heart and mind. So name them and place them before God. He already knows what's in you. So do that, you know, verbally in your prayer time, in your seeking time. You know, let, let God in on what you're thinking. The second thing, don't beat yourself up. Too many people beat themselves up about their doubts. And so much so that there are times that um, that life with God begins to kind of dim and that light goes a little bit down and, and you're almost to where the light is out because you're beating yourself up so much and you think of yourself as I must be unworthy I'm so unworthy I can't even continue walking with God I feel so guilty God doesn't want that for you do not beat yourself up you have a God that loves you and is walking with you ahead of you and holding your hand and carrying you when need be the third thing share honestly with someone else or with the community of faith that's why small groups are important And whether your small group is the choir, whether your small small group is the ladies' Bible study, whether your small group is a Sunday school class or meeting around a table at dinner away from the church, whatever it is, you know, share these things with people that you trust and who you are in community with. Because not only will they share that burden in prayer for you, um, but you can also do the same for them. And maybe you can help them to see something that they have never seen before. So share those questions um, with people that, that you do life with, life with God with. And then finally, keep taking steps. Keep taking one step at a time. Don't run Don't hide. Don't leave your relationship with Jesus um, over any questions or doubts that you might have. And, you know, sometimes we think, well, you know, it's this one question and maybe I'll feel better about it next week. Sometimes these seasons of our life with God can be quite lengthy. But hang in there. Take steps. Be a part of a small group. Have somebody that you can talk with. Come talk to me about those things that you are feeling. And let's pray together. Um, Because I do with a small group of people myself, when I doubt something, when I'm questioning something that God has said or God has has let me know in one way or the other, and I'm struggling with it, I share that with a small group of people, and I ask for their prayers, and I covet their prayers. So recognize them, name them, don't beat yourself up about them, share honestly with community, and keep taking each and every step. So remember what I shared at the beginning of the message? I shared a quote from Chris Jamie, the poet. And she said, doubt is a question mark and faith is an exclamation point. The most compelling, believable, realistic stories have included them both. And here's where it's so right and such the good news for us today. Because this this way of Thomas being himself and being honest and saying, I just, I cannot believe this unless I see it. That was his question mark. But then look what happens when Jesus, again, doesn't punish him, doesn't reprimand him, doesn't chase him out of his little disciple group and tell him to go off somewhere else. Um, What does he do? He says, here, touch me. Here. Here. Go ahead, whatever you need, I'm here to give you whatever you need. And that's when the exclamation point came. Because Thomas uh, made that confession, which a lot of people say is the most succinct, powerful confession of faith, at least in John's gospel. And he said, my Lord and my God. 
See, that's what happens when we give to God exactly who we are and where we are, wherever that is on the journey, and that we trust God with that. And it's my prayer that as we do that, that we too will exclaim with that exclamation point, that epiphany, light bulb type of moment in that area where you're asking questions, my Lord and my God. Would you pray with me? You have invited us, God, to come into your presence just the way we are. We are invited to come with our real, authentic selves, not as we hope to be, but how we are. We are invited to come not after we have dressed ourselves in the best of our self-righteous finery. We are invited to come not after we've cleansed our hearts of nagging doubts and endless questions. We are invited to come into your presence just as we are, trusting that you love us and carry us to new places of faith. God, this prayer we offer individually and as a community of believers, and we are confident that you will do that in our life exactly what we are seeking to grow our faith in your Son, Jesus, our Lord. And we ask this in his most holy name. Amen. Amen. What a great morning it has been, and it's going to be uh, even much more so as we stand to sing our closing hymn. Um, if you do choose to sing, we just ask that you put those masks back on. Um, make sure you check out the prayer garden, and I want to extend the invitation um, that, that I like to extend every single week, and that is if you have a place in your life, and especially in your life with the Lord, that you are unsure about, that you have questions about, that you don't know how to take the next step, please call me. Please reach out to me. Um, there is no better work I would rather do than um, to help you. And in that, you are helping me as well. So know that that invitation is always open um, for you and for anyone you know. So let's stand now and sing our closing hymn, Because He Lives. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to pray. My Savior lives because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know. i
across the river, I'll find life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he I hope when you sang those words, because he lives, all fear is gone. God welcomes your questions. God welcomes with love any doubt that you might have. Don't run from God, but run toward God with those. And he will, he will fill you. Go forth with the blessing and the assurance of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.